since we opened uh, February 9th, we've had over 14,000 visitors. Uh, about 10,000 of them have been coming, paying admission to, to the gallery, and, and about 10% of that has been students. And so we're really delighted at the, um, the support from the community, and we want to thank um, the Hong Kong SAR government for their investment in us and the Jockey Club and our supporters. Without their support, we would not be able to do programs like this. Um, even before we opened in this new home, uh, we were average, we were doing about 100 programs a year. And now with this facility, um, exhibition, gallery, as well as theater, I know we will be doubling that kind of, that number in, in this year. I just came back uh, from the Asia Society Houston Center opening um, about a week ago. And their new building has been uh, beautifully designed from Mr. Tanaguchi, who designed MoMA. And we have a friendly rivalry there. We open first, and we open with a bang uh, in this wonderful explosive magazine. And they open with a beautiful, very serene building. And really, the orphan in this whole equation has been Asia Society New York. Although they have a beautiful building on Park Avenue uh, and 72nd, 71st Street, um, they're feeling a bit underappreciated these days, and uh, rightly so. And without their origin, uh, starting in 1956, Asia Society by uh, John D. Rockefeller, we would not be here today. And Asia Society Hong Kong has been here since 1990. Um, yesterday, we had the honor of entertaining uh, Sir Q.W. Lee's family here at the, at the center. And uh, without people like Sir Q.W. and many of our founders, again, we would not be here today. Um, most of you, if you have not had a chance to see the site, uh, tonight is our last Thursday of the month, and we're open till 8 o'clock. And every last Thursday of the month, you can, I hope you will make this a destination. Uh, come, enjoy the, uh, uh, the gallery. Have a drink. Ammo Cafe just opened this week, soft opening. So we hope this to be the destination uh, of choice for designers, architects, uh, fun-loving uh, people. Um, so please come back and join us um, uh, whenever you're in Wan Chai, uh, whenever you're in a Pacific place, um, because this is going to be your home. And those of you who are not members yet, I encourage you to become a member. Currently, membership is about 2,000. And our chairman has a very ambitious goal for us to double that. And again, I think we can, I think we can reach that number with your support. And without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Ken, who's going to get the program started. And again, thank you for coming and become part of our family. And those of you who know me, um, I just want to let you know that I have a twin brother who gives me a bad name. I'm the serious architect. Um, I started the issue design. For, oh, it's okay. Any press around here? Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know him from a bath, so. <laughs> I want to. I started the issue design for about 20 plus years ago, as a, as a, as a quiz session. I would write letters to maybe about 100 architects. And I would fix the venue that everybody arrives on a Friday night. And then on Saturday, they get about half an hour each, 20 minutes each, to say, talk about an idea. Then in front of them, uh, we would have a panel of critics. And then so this goes on for the whole day. And then on the next day, uh, we would do the same thing again um, to an audience from the local Institute of Architects. And then like a Greek tragedy, by Sunday night, it's all over. Everybody goes home. So I've organized these events in Kuala Lumpur, in uh, Bali, in uh, Melbourne, in Sahoro, um, and in Jeju, and various other places. Then about a few years back, I got tired of doing it because people were, you know, came and posed. So I thought, you know, you know bugger, that's not the sort of thing you want to do. So then I met Chris again, uh, my friend Cliff again, and then he suggested this wonderful idea of a roulette. I thought, that's great, you know, we're all into gambling and that, uh, you know. And his theme was Asia bets in architecture. So I thought it's pretty good, you know, that's what Asia's doing now. And so um, this is our third event. Um, in this evening, we have two uh, alumni of our Asia Design Forum. Uh, we have Mr. Hitoshi Abe, one of the speakers today. Where's uh, Hitoshi? Yeah, he was much skinnier and happier in those days, but now he's... <laughs> In 1994, wasn't it, in Sahoro? 
It was snowing then. And then we have Lawrence Liao from last year at Shanghai. Is Lawrence here? Oh, Lawrence isn't here yet. Okay. So, um, so that's great. And I'm very happy to have all of you here tonight. And we have a wonderful set of speakers and, and curated by Marisa. And she really put her heart and soul in the whole thing. And we're very grateful for her. We should give her a round of applause for organizing this. <laughs> my co-convener is Clifford. He's my, uh, one of my best friends. I've known him for, since he was a baby. <laughs> and um, are you speaking next, Clifford? Come on, come and come and come and say a few words. Yeah. Clifford's with Architectural Record. Good as any, better than most. Thank you, Ken. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, this is the third design roulette that we've done. The whole idea is to just sort of shake up the way people think about architecture and the built environment. Um, Asia Design Forum is unaffiliated with any university, government, so we're sort of a, um, a free thinking, free um, moving organization. We try to be nimble on our feet and we try to, you know, make sure that people um, engage with the built environment and mix different dif uh, disciplines together. We don't want architects just speaking to themselves. Um, so we have a developer on the panel tonight. We have uh, someone from a, a settlement organization, social services organization. Um, and the idea is to bring different types of people together but all thinking and provoking different ways of thinking about the built environment. Um, I also want to thank some of our sponsors. First of all, the Asia Society for letting us have this beautiful space. Thank you, Alice. Um, the AIA Hong Kong, which has been a, you know, um, a huge uh, contributor. Christine Bruckner, the, uh, the chapter president, has been a real um, uh, major contributor to uh, to the event. Um, also, uh, Lux Newhouse and Jimmy Tong. He's been uh, one of our sponsors for all three of the design roulettes that we've done, so we really appreciate Jimmy's help. Um, Taiping Carpet is a sponsor today. We really appreciate their contribution. <laughs> Dornbrock is uh, sponsoring a uh, dinner that we're having afterwards. Um, Eskew, which is Marissa and her husband Eric, Obviously, they've made a uh, um, huge contribution to what we're doing tonight. Um, the Hong Kong Institute of Architects has also helped out. Ani Albert and her uh, public relations firm, Ani IMC, has helped out. Um, Architectural Record, my employer, is one of the um, media sponsors, and Perspective Magazine as well. Anyway, so uh, let's give a round of applause to all of our sponsors and all of the contributing organizations. So now I'm going to hand things over to Marissa Yu, I think, yes, and she's going to come up and she and, oh, I'm sorry, Christine Bruckner from the AIA Hong Kong. As I said, she's uh, been uh, a major player in putting this all together. Christine? Thank you, Cliff, and thank you, Marissa. I just wanted to say welcome and thank you all so much for coming today. And I just wanted to say it's been a privilege working with ADF and the Asia Society to really bring everybody together on such a meaningful event. You know, we're three non for profit organizations who all really care about the built environment. And the AIA Hong Kong, um, particularly, prides itself on being a collaborative, coordinating volunteer organization, working with the community and profession throughout the region to raise awareness for issues of the built environment, including design excellence and livable cities and communities. And this is exactly the kind of event that we are really keen on, and it's been an honor to be part of it, and we look forward to the discussion. We'll be continuing these types of discussions as we go forward. On May 9th, we're talking about living cities, looking at actual advanced materials that you might bring as you envision how you build the cities that are going to be discussed. And how do we actually create these beautiful, aesthetic, and ethical cities? So we look forward to continuing the dialogue. And I'd like to now welcome Marissa to come forward and really get us kicked off and started. Thank you.
Okay, let's get started. <laughs> I'm not with Marissa. This is, this is meant to be um, very casual and fun and hopefully relax. So if you haven't had two glasses of wine, you're welcome to go back, pick up a glass of wine, come back and join us. Um, I'm, I'm joined by wonderful Douglas Young on my left, who will be my partner in crime. And um, I wanted just to perhaps uh, explain a little bit about the Design Roulette Hong Kong topic. It's been wonderful that Cliff, Ken, and Christine and all has sort of been brainstorming, and in particular working with um, Jimmy and Eric and a couple of um, other friends to put this um, a sequential dialogue project. So just to jump a few slides, um, and our wonderful AV guys, I actually need the, um, the remote. <laughs> Control, it's on, okay. The suspense is killing me. How come this is not working? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Okay, let's move this along. It's a bit sensitive. Okay, there we are. Um, so the topic today, um, architecture between beauty and ethics, um, just to give a very short story, I think um, talking a lot with a couple of people and brainstorming about the theme um, over the last six months, I would say, in, in developing this, this concept um, and talking to Jimmy, who's been a wonderful support, Hong Kong is seen as this um, world of efficiency and extreme, um, in one sense, in its density, verticality, and efficiency. And we are always constantly involved um, in shaping us. Um, of course, the, the incredible statistics are Hong Kong um, has the most skyscrapers above 14 floors. Uh, Hong Kong has around 8,000 of them, almost double to um, New York, its nearest rival. At the same time, um, do we think of this as a beautiful city? Um, it is pragmatic, I suppose, to some, but who do we design the city for? And there are many issues with this kind of production of the city um, about lack of um, uh, public space, um, the current issues of housing and society. But this really makes, I think, Hong Kong very unique and extremely charming. Um, but with our own sort of um, sensibilities to aesthetic considerations, um, I think Hong Kong at the same time is not local, but very global in a sense where um, more and more the, the kind of gap between um, the rich and the poor, or I would say the use of space and efficiency has challenged the profession of architects and developers and planners. So, how do we as um, professionals build um, this kind of larger society with um, particular visions where maybe aesthetics and ethics can begin to be together? Or can buildings look sexy and perhaps also do really well also? So some of these are the major questions um, to raise today. Um, one other slide I have here which is a cultural experiment, I would say, with Lux New House, is we wanted to um, demonstrate the potential of three visual models. You'll see at the back of the auditorium, maybe afterwards, that raises questions about can ornament, perhaps with interior and exterior lighting, both be sustainable? Imagine this as a, a architectural facade structure. Um, and then I need to, um, also an abstract density model at the back also modularized to potentially build new types of petition housing perhaps. Is that good or is that bad? Is that ethical? And then finally, one other visual model at the back of the room 
it's so delicious made out of white chocolate. It's so delicious that could we actually eat, engage, and forget basically about how we live, eat, and just be extremely in utopia. So these are my questions, and I asked Douglas last week, you have one slide to hand over and to respond to the theme before we kick off officially. So this is Douglas Young's contribution. If I can turn this. <laughs> Very reluctant. Douglas. Right, so thanks, Marissa, for my three minutes worth of fame. Um, can buildings be sexy? I think this building is deadly sexy because it's naked, because it's honest, because it's showing you what it's about, it's showing you its guts and full of glory. I think maybe, this is actually, by the way, in Saigong. It's a, actually a, the back of a Saigong seafood restaurant. And um, it's a case, I suppose, where the tenants are the, really the architects. It's not the architect. The tenants are the ones that finish off the building. Maybe they are the designers after all. And I think, actually, I think that's one of the peculiarities of Hong Kong. And it's, I think, a feature, feature or characteristic about Hong Kong architecture that we should celebrate, not suppress. Um, I think we should celebrate our differences. I think Hong Kong should be different to the rest of the world. We should find our own identity. And um, I don't think we should conform. I don't think we should homogenize. So hopefully, maybe through tonight's discussion, we can bring more, um, bring out the features of Hong Kong. A lot of you are visitors, and maybe you can contribute and you can reflect with us as to what makes Hong Kong special and different. I'm really looking forward to it, Marissa. Okay, thanks, Douglas. So um, to explain the design roulette um, actual um, uh, rundown, um, it's going to be a bit tricky, but we're going to invite um, Hitoshi Abisang to join us on the stage um, and Mr. Rocco Yim first. And I have been tasked to be timing everyone's presentation. Abisang, please join us. You will be on this chair and then Mr. Rocco Yim on the left. No wine? No wine, no. <laughs> <laughs> and um, to, to basically illustrate the, um, we will have five minute um, presentations by the speaker, followed by the um, preceding speaker to um, interview the current speaker, and at five minutes, the bell will ring, you will have to stop, and your interview will also last for five minutes. When that's done, we will start playing the roulette game. And Cliff and Ken, thank you for putting me in this very difficult position. This is an experiment in itself. Okay, Rocco, would you like to control your own slides? Okay. <laughs> so this is the advanced advancement. Okay. Yep. You may. Oh, I do. You have to introduce Rocco. <laughs> You did already, but I may, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Rocco, uh, who is very renowned architect in Hong Kong, and uh, I think we'll become friends soon. <laughs> Please welcome Rocco. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Abby. Uh, we are supposed to address this issue of social disparity within five minutes and with five images. That's a really tall order. So I'll just stick with four very simple statements and a pretty picture. First statement, if I can get it to work. Architecture is an art. Now, this is a simple statement. It's almost a no-brainer. But to me, it is a problematic statement. In fact, it is a statement that is well, maybe responsible for some, a few architectural gems, but it is actually resulted in a lot of the architectural junk that we have around, among us. The most problematic part of the statement is in the punctuation, in the full stop. It shouldn't 
stop there. To me, architecture is an art of problem solving, which contributes to spiritual and our mental well-being. Now, only then can we fully understand the role of architecture, which means that we have to then understand the role of the architect. In my days, when we were in school, not that long ago, architects are not artists. They're very distinct people. But increasingly, I think we have tried to blur the boundary between architects and artists. Many architects want to be artists. They pretend to be artists. That is our problem. I want to say that although architects could have artistic inclinations, they could have artistic sensibilities, artistic perception, they could play the violin, they could paint a picture. But categorically, architects are not artists. Because the role of architecture, all right, it has to look good, because bringing beauty into our environment is one of the problems that we should address. But it actually should do good. And only then would it feel good. When users are satisfied, when they're inspired, when they are liberated and comforted by the architecture, then we would really have an authentic piece of architecture with a sustained feel-good factor. Now, in the light of what I've just said, I would like to show you a picture or a series of images, architectural images, that are both positive and negative examples, in my mind, of architecture. Now, I'm not going to tell you what I think of those. I have my own opinion, but I really want you to form your own judgment based on what I said. Here it goes. I should have stopped here, but since Carrie is here tonight, I have to talk a little bit about Tema, the last image. <laughs> because Tema is an example of the architecture resulted from a desire to solve specific problems. One important problem is to put three distinct organizations, LegCo, Government Office, and Exco, who don't really want to be together, frankly, onto one site. In a way, that they are seen to be communicating with each other, but they could actually go about their own business with autonomy. So this is one problem. The other problem is making use of this site to provide an urban connection between the south part of the city to the north from the inner city to the waterfront in a way that people could go freely without being bothered by the political circus that goes around in the building around them. But there is a more important problem that we should address, and that goes back to the visual metaphor of this complex, door always open. Now, it doesn't mean the door should be always open to press or to the protesters. That is what the press is on about. It really means that in this age, we need a reminder that Hong Kong prospers and becomes successful because we are an open society because we have an open mindset, because we are receptive to newcomers. In an age when we are worried about mainland women coming to give birth, we are worried about mainlanders buying up our property, and when the mere appointment of a junior post in a future administration of a mainland lady is causing hysteria in the press, I think it is a timely reminder that we should be an open society. Thank you, Mr. Rocco Yim. Your five okay, minutes is you. up. Uh, <laughs> Abhi Sam, we will start your interview Q&A. Actually, you know, um, 
by looking at this diagram you created, that makes artists really bad person. You want to have a comment on it? It's almost like artists only take care beauty part looks. Is that all? Well, I have not said that any of this building is bad. I haven't said it. No, I didn't. And I haven't really said that any one building is done by an artist and the others are not by an artist. I haven't really said that either. But I think artists have a role in society and architects have a role in society. And I think at the end of the day, the mentality and the inclement of the two are not the same. That's my belief. And to blur their roles and to try to be one while you are not really one is going to hurt the profession. And in the end, it doesn't bring good to the society. But um, you said that the difference is, I mean, from the diagram you said, the problem between artist and architect is because the architect is the sort of a, a, a profession to solve the problem. But also, um, then artists sometimes also they propose problem solving. Or, or also there's an architecture who actually present the problem, not necessarily solve the problem itself. How, how do you see those? Well, there might be exceptions, but in my mind, architects should solve the problems. And artists usually raise the problems. Artists usually give you problems to think about. And I think that is the role of the artist. He makes you think. He may not tell you the answer. Everybody has to think about the answer. And that is, the, I think, the difference between an architect and an artist. I see. So um, where the beauty lies there, then? Also the profession that deal with uh, some sort of uh, beautiness, I hope? I think there are different perceptions of what beauty is. Uh, in one extreme case, of course, anything that is useful is beautiful. There is a saying, maybe Oscar Wilde, uh -huh. who said that the most beautiful things it has come across are from those things that people start out trying to make useful. Whereas the ugliest things that they have come across are things that people try to start out to make them beautiful. And I think that has a lesson in there somewhere. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> that is the whole purpose of Rocco, you, you make, you make so buildings sound completely utilitarian. I mean, surely there's poetry in architecture, no? I mean, surely we should be encouraging more artistry in our buildings in Hong Kong, where, you know, actually they are just buildings, they're not architecture. There is a difference between architecture and building. Maybe that's where the artistry comes in. But poetry comes, I think, when you solve a building, a solve a problem with creativity and innovation. So it's no use just solving the problem. It's how you solve the problem and how you raise the problem solving to a level of art. But, uh, you know, there's a building totally functional, but mm -hmm. ugly. Is this beautiful in terms of sort of architecture? Could be. Could be. I'm not denying it. Really? Yes. <laughs> Which one, right? I mean, you want to talk about that now? <laughs> <laughs> I won't talk about it. If you press me, I'll divert your attention to Ken or David here. I mean, um, no, I'm just curious. You want to talk about, a little bit talk about Hong Kong, your town, in relationship to functionality and beauty and you know, this thing? Mm -hmm. I think one of the important functions of Hong Kong architecture is try to enhance the city through the architecture. Try to make the city work better through the design in the architecture, like the connectivity, like enhancing movement, view, vista, integration with topography and with surroundings. So those things would bring beauty, I think, into the end result. So Hong Kong is a beautiful city? In some ways, yes. What do you mean, in some place? <laughs> Where? <The show. laughs> okay. Tell me one example. <laughs> OK, one example is that 
up to now, in solving all these problems that I mentioned, architects tend to neglect sustainability, which is why some of the buildings, or most of our previous buildings, are still ugly, because that particular aspect has not really received a due attention until now. Okay, maybe there's an aesthetic to sustainability. So thank you very much, mm -hmm. Mr. Rocco Yim. Please stay. And oh. Abhi Sang, you will join your audience. Yes. Uh, Rocco, you have to move to your left. And we are now joined by David. Okay. <laughs> David Jennerton here is the Asian partner of OMA, Asia. Now, need I say more? Thank you for showing our building. I, I'm curious what you f think of it, but <laughs> let's, let's do that outside this audience. <laughs> uh, so let me see if I can. Oh, that goes way too fast. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to put this uh, whole question that we're asking ourselves in a little perspective um, because we can try to be important as architects and planners, but actually only 8% of the built environment in the world is actually planned by professionals. Um, so what is our social relevance and uh, should we talk about our social responsibility? Uh, maybe designing something beautiful uh, and good at the same time is actually uh, not uh, what we should really uh, discuss. Is our social responsibility not much broader than that? Should architecture go beyond its own profession? And should it investigate connections uh, with politicians, bankers, institutions, thinkers, and maybe also individuals to discuss the real development of society and uh, not related to the projects we are actually working on ourselves? It's also important to look carefully at what defines beauty and social success. Is beauty based on perception that is for everybody the same? Does social success provoke beautiful design? Or is perception maybe based on the level of social success and is beauty therefore irrelevant in most social conditions? Very often, Beauty that grew naturally and was historically relevant without any intervention of architects and planners is replaced by thought of and social initiated built form that symbolizes the progression of society and humanity. Is this contribution by architects and planners actually something to be proud of? Or should we question how we could influence social progression and natural beauty in a different way? OMA, uh, Remcoas, and myself were, and are sometimes even still, criticized for willing to build for CCTV, a new headquarters in Beijing. The critique is mainly focused on the fact that people find it immoral to build a very present building uh, within Beijing for a closed institution not working according to Western et uh, ethics. Our answer to that is, do you provoke positive and social change by ignoring the present? Or should you engage the possibility to change by contributing the future? Anyway, we address the critics by uh, making the building disappear at night. And uh, we hoped that people never noticed the building. Uh, seeing all the opinion about the building, uh, I'm not so sure if we were successful in this case. Um, to end in a less critical way and maybe uh, less philosophical, I'm also delighted to see that OMA's buildings are sometimes used in unexpected ways before the building is even finished, or in a way that we could not think about, that is actually all about beauty and ethics, uh, like the marriage. Thank you. David, you still have two minutes to, to sell your project. How, how much do I Two more minutes. Two more, I, I, I ignore these two minutes. Okay, so Rocco. You mean I have to ask 
two more minutes of questions? No, you, no. you have okay. five minutes. <laughs> um, okay, David. From my understanding, the word beauty hasn't really been in much of OMA's vocabulary. Uh, in fact, among the so-called star architects, Mr. Rem Kohar has my utmost respect because I don't think he ever pretends to be an artist. He's a philosopher, he's a, well, he's a journalist, uh, he's a problem solver, he's an intellectual, but I never remember him pretending to be an artist. Am I correct? Uh, you should ask him, but um, <laughs> I, I think uh, you're right. And I, I think th that's also why I question uh, what beauty actually is and what an architect can contribute to it. Um, because what, how OMA or how we address a problem is not to create something that has a predicted outcome. Uh, so, and a predicted outcome is often uh, the goal of artists or somebody that says, I want to create something beautiful in, ad in advance. Uh, that is not where we start. Uh, we, we try to start with context and try to learn from the context. Uh, and, and in the end, an architect is not some, somebody that creates beauty. We shape a space. We, we work with air. A lot of people think that architects actually work with materials and and, and use materials to express something, but the only way an architect really can express something is by um, making uh, air as a space and then hope that people can use them and provoke the use in it. Um, and I think from that perspective, uh, we uh, as OMA, but also REM uh, in particular, uh, doesn't think about is a building beautiful or isn't, it, it needs to contribute to, to a context, much more than beauty. Okay, that it confirms that uh, my observation is more or less correct, uh, because you emphasize process, you mentioned. You emphasize analysis of existing conditions and users' requirements and possible uh, typological evolutions, things like that. And the buildings are what they become. However, I'm going to be provocative. <laughs> that is certainly true of most of the buildings that you did, OMA did. Certainly, Seattle Library looks that way to me. Uh, maybe the stock exchange, St. Jen. But is CCTV a little bit different? To me, CCTV seems to start off with a very strong intention to create a form in Rem's words in those days, to show the world of a different possible high-rise typology. So is that the exception? No, it's not the exception. Um, it's actually uh, the project that confirms uh, the approach. Because when you are asked to create a skyscraper and in 2002, in the middle of Beijing, it needed to be the highest building in the city, uh, preferable also the highest building in the world, to then come uh, with an answer uh, that responds to the context, actually stays within the context and not tries to rise above it, and also tries to address a functionality of the process of making TV, which is a sequential business, and coming up with a building that is nothing more than the sequence of the program of making TV, and therefore a loop, and then stating that you actually make the highest building in the world because a loop is continuous and never ending, and therefore nobody can surpass that typology anymore. So we're finally uh, outside of the discussion uh, that architects have now to, should I go higher, and how can I go higher? How can I be beautiful when I go high? It, it doesn't make any sense. People don't like to be one kilometer up in the air. So why would we uh, come up with something that addresses that? I think it's actually the, the opposite of how you say it. It's, it's, it's a shape and, and definitely not a form that wants to be beautiful. Coming back to your presentation, you said earlier that your observation is that only about 8% of all 
buildings in Israel is designed by architects. Uh, and you seem to imply that the influence architects have is quite limited. Uh, but are things in this world mostly influenced by minority? Think of Martin Luther King. Think of Gandhi. They are in the minority. And yet what they've done has tremendous impact. Do you think architects could do that, even though they are not responsible for designing the majority of the buildings? I think architects can have an impact, definitely. Uh, and, and we're working on that every day, I think, uh, all in our profession. But the, the impact that I was implying that could be bigger than just the impact of built form is that if you make coalitions that can study a context that goes beyond just this 8% physical attention within your profession, you can create something that is not only architecture, but that has uh, really an attachment to context and to other professions that influence, I think, significantly what we are doing. Um, as an architect, you're not alone on an island. Uh, you work with many different uh, David, parts. Like, uh, David, if I may ask you a question about your previous slide, because it reminds me of the slide that I presented. And you mentioned beauty. I mean, and you mentioned that beauty is to do with how, what our education system, how we're like groom to think that certain things are beautiful and certain things are ugly. Uh, maybe, you know, is there a case for um, a change in beauty? Or maybe beauty, for now, is merely a decadent term. You know, beauty, if we talk about beauty, if we, if we pursue beauty, ultimately it's, it's, it's futile. Because I remember there was an Intelligence Square debate uh, last year about, you know, should art be beautiful? And, you know, if something is out to be beautiful, as Rocco said, ultimately is destined to fail because beauty is for future generations. You know, uh, art and architecture should be progressive and progressive things when they first appear often are shocking. You know, they're not conventionally beautiful. What do you think about that? Okay, so you get to have 10 more seconds because of your, and then. I, I think you're right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rocco Yim. David, please move up. And um, can I invite Michael to join us, please? Hello. Yeah, this, this one. Yeah, this one. Okay, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Michael Lai Kamchung. Um, he's uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the St. James Settlement. Oh, oh, oops. Right. Oh, that's the last one. Okay, thank you very much. Being the odd man out, not an architect, not in the professional, I like to talk about a grassroots thing that because I feel building is for the people. Therefore, should people have to say, um, I've been involved in uh, Wan Chai uh, for a long, long time. My organization been doing a lot of work for the people in Wan Chai. Uh, we are very involved in uh, urban redevelopment and helping the people. But then we emphasize on one very important thing, um, is participation, community participation. Sorry. Right. Oh, this should, uh, right. Uh, more than 10 years ago, we started with uh, the people participation in planning and also giving idea in how our city, our community should be built. Uh, we have a group called uh, Designing Hong Kong. I'm sure a lot of people are in that group still and uh, been participating in planning, in designing and so on. Uh, this is one example of people participating in building a park in Lun Fat Street in Wan Chai. Uh, we have a number of um, charrette, 
people designing the place and then the architect helping to implement and putting it into a beautiful park. It still stands, although behind it is a rubbish dump, but we managed to hide the rubbish dump behind those walls, and the people are still using it. Then we take things to the extreme. Uh, I'm so grateful Carrie is here. She is responsible for helping us with uh, getting the Blue House um, into a preserving beauty, I would say. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about cosmetic thing, but talking about preserving not only the hardware, but also the software. That is very important. Uh, my partner is also here, Maggie is also here tonight. Uh, we have a lot of participation from the people telling us what to do, telling the architect what to do. So I, I'm challenging uh, the audience here whether a uh, building is for the people, therefore the people should have a say as well. Uh, we also, like David, uh, have this building um, having a lot of newly wet coming in to take picture. So it's, it's got a very functional approach as well, even before preservation. We were put into this building two small restaurants, uh, that is for the people, cheap price, cheap cost, and also some um, small museum. At the same, same time, people will live there. That is the most important thing, uh, thanks to Kerry, in a way. Uh, this is the first project where the hardware, as well as the software, will be preserved in this building. But it take a long, long time. The government procedure been a nightmare to me. Uh, the reason why I still couldn't retire from my job <laughs> is because of this building. Uh, uh, on Monday, I met Carrie, and she said, don't you dare to retire. <laughs> so finally, my statement is that we want a sustainable community. Now, one child has been going through a sustainable development program some two, uh, 10 years ago. We used the Agenda 21, uh, and this is part of a government document done up by the uh, Sustainable Development Council, of which I'm a member, and there is the issue of urban living space, and you can see the three dimension of social, economic, as well as balancing the environment. So I am saying that we should go back to the basic, that sustainability is important. A sustainable community is important. I hope one child will become a sustainable community. Thank you. Perfect five minutes. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Um, I would like to ask you, you say that the community plays a, an important role in, in shaping uh, part of the city. Um, to give the community a platform, uh, what should the role of the Hong Kong government be um, in supporting that, in your opinion? First and foremost, I think mentality to have more uh, an open-minded approach. People like Kerry have a very open-minded uh, approach to let the people have their say. But then uh, you will challenge that, I I'm sure, saying that then you have all sort of different planning, all sort of idea coming in from the grassroots. But mind you, uh, if you give them good guideline, now uh, when we've done the experiment with the open space, the park, we sort of draw the boundary, uh, telling them what can be done, what cannot be done. So the people that participate will know their limits. So I think, first of all, open-mindedness. Secondly, to draw the boundary, uh, let uh, free flow of idea. Then ultimately, it's the architect that put all these ideas into practice, into the building. Um, but, but when there are so many people that are so open-minded within Hong Kong, why doesn't it happen uh, so often yet? Uh, the, do you see a reason? 
Well, although I'm an advocate of this movement, but mind you, uh, apparently we are the only community, except maybe some Shepo, another area, that have tried this out. Um, Linfa Street is one example that it has been tried out uh, because of the district council. At that time, uh, the district council uh, have backing of this project. Uh, so we need not only the government, but also the district councillor that help us, and also a group of very enthusiastic people that help. And, and do you think that an approach like this could be a counterpart for uh, the developers that uh, rule so many development inside uh, the city, or can it never be equal? Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm not anti-developer. Uh, my good friend Donald is here. Uh, I will ask him. Uh, uh, but basically, I, I feel um, that that should be a balance. Um, they should follow uh, some of the idea that put forward by the people, uh, because as I said, we need a sustainable community. The community is important uh, to the fact that it, it, if you buy a house or a flat, uh, then you are part of that community. So I suppose uh, the developer would sometimes listen to the people uh, what kind of uh, flat they want, not small flat anymore. Okay. I, I, I read when I, when I was preparing uh, today that you are a, a large supporter of the philosophy of social, social enterprises. Uh, not as a kind of welfare, but more as a kind of business that can sustain itself. Um, do you think that the social enterprise could be a business uh, that could become involved in urban and social renewal projects in, in the city and, and therefore maybe be that counterpart of, of the developer? Oh, you asked a very good question. I can go for hours on this, but then I can only, uh, I think, 30 seconds. Basically, I'm a strong supporter of social enterprise and uh, also the business model of doing social enterprises. First of all, there is a social mission you must uh, fulfill. There is a double uh, bottom line. Uh, you are using a business model uh, to fulfill a social mission. But that social mission is more important than money. But then uh, nowadays, uh, organizations are moving towards this goal of trying to get their mission done by using a business model. At the same time, they hope to generate some uh, income uh, in order to expand that particular service. Or example I have with my job is that we've been able to generate enough money to kickstart or to reinvent our food bank, Hong Kong food bank, uh, in 2002 when we have the economic downturn. So this is a very, very important uh, issue that we uh, not only support a business model, but to fulfill a certain mission that will fit into society. Can I ask one more question? The two minutes that I let, let yeah, go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, right, right. Go do, ahead, do you think that the Blue House Cluster will become an exemplar for community participation, participation in Hong Kong? Definitely. Um, we have the resident group uh, coming in to help as well. They are part of our partner. We've got four partners in James, uh, and, and then we've got Hong Kong Heritage, and then we've got a cultural group, and then the people. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank, Thank you, David. David. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Dono, do you want to join us up on the stage? Okay, let me introduce Dono, my good friend. Well, uh, I think we need no introduction because uh, He's an architect himself. Uh, he built our airport uh, terminal. Uh, he also built the Hong Kong railway station. Uh, but then he moved on to become a developer. So uh, without much ado, uh, Donald.
I think as a um, professional architect, uh, we have an unwritten contract with our society to serve the public interest uh, ahead of our public interest, including that of our client and our own profession. Um, architect as custodian of uh, our environment has often failed to protest against the wholesale destruction of our traditional neighborhood and fail to speak out when our natural resources are ruined by development. Uh, I think such failures have resulted in the increased distrust of architecture as an instrument to facilitate and inspire a better society. Uh, while an ethical architect should work toward a caring community, government is much more effective in eliminating injustice and narrowing the wealth gap in our society. I think the housing problem due to the reduction of government spending on subsidized housing when the Gini coefficient has been increasing in Hong Kong cannot be solved by architect and developer alone. However, to practice ethically does not mean the architect cannot claim authority on architecture. On the contrary, I mean, my belief is that an ethical architect must exert the authority on how architecture should be practiced. I mean, if you look at the uh, doctor's ethics, is to look after the uh, physical well-being of patient, but no surgeon will relinquish on uh, his or her medical authority and consult the public on how operations should be performed. Um, to build critically is to confront the practical problems with an elegant solution that goes beyond the purely utilitarian function. Uh, beauty has been built with suspicion you know, since the early 20th century. The Western hegemonic enterprises of modernism has created a perceived dilemma between beauty and ethics in architecture. Uh, the premise of Adolfo's essay, Ornament and Crime, and the rise of postmodernism as a form of social resistance are familiar to most of you. Uh, and I don't want to go into the discussion about the philosophy of uh, what is built and so on in architecture. But what I want to discuss is that built is one of the cr critical dimensions in the ethical practice of architecture. Um, most buildings in Hong Kong are pretty good and serve the public interest without engaging the public. For example, I cannot use your public office despite how functional well it has been designed. Um, the conventional thinking for architecture to engage the community is then through urban design. But in Hong Kong, the community gathering places are very often privatized public spaces, like shopping malls. Uh, and their activities are very much controlled. Uh, even if architects can create truly public spaces, they are common pool resources that could be dominated and depleted of their public value by special interest groups. I mean, if you look at the Occupy Hong Kong movement at the uh, public plaza underneath the Hong Kong Bank, um, then you will notice that you know, the space really has been hijacked. That leaves the external building form the only available component of architecture for easy collective consumption. Uh, it is the public good, in my view, that architecture can provide regardless of private ownership and limitation on resources. To build beautifully, is to serve the public interest and give inspiration to the community. Um, architects has made a bargain with the community to have a moralistic uh, practice of architecture by promising the production of public goods in return. Um, the necessary social and political institutions uh, which facilitate this critical dimension of the architect's practice are often sadly missing and uh, not sufficiently provided for in Hong Kong. But built is having I mean, one of the public goods under the direct control of architects that can be and should be delivered by the architect. The everyday buildings are equally important as iconic buildings to inform and inspire the public. Therefore, I think mean, in conclusion, what I'm saying is that to build ethically is also to build beautifully. All right, Donald, uh, uh, my first question uh, concern uh, the conflict between uh, an architect and a developer. Well, um, if a developer 
want to use up all the pot ratio, then build a very ugly building. Uh, as an architect, what would you do? Well, I think using up all the pot ratio doesn't mean it is an ugly building. I think that is a wrong assumption already. I mean, also I think the conflict between developer is architect and architect is also a wrong uh, assumption. I think developer, architects, uh, government officials, I mean, contractors, they are all, you know, trying to build a better environment for Hong Kong. And, you know, uh, what we need really is align all their interests. I mean, it's rather not to say developer, you are on one side of the fence and architect is on the other. We have different interests and the community also has different interests. I mean, we need to work together to build a better, better environment. Uh, Michael, yeah. well, aren't you, what, what you're saying really is, you know, sometimes it's not up to the architect whether the building is going to end up beautiful yeah. because it's up to the, uh, the developer and the developer's interest is to maximize profits. Um, so how do you resolve this seemingly yeah. contradictory yeah. Kind of request? Well, I, again, I think, you know, maximizing profit and, you know, having good architecture that contributes to the well-being of the community. I mean, that is not you know, mutually exclusive. It can be a win-win situation. You, actually, you're in a oh. unique position of being both an architect and a developer, and I, I can't agree with you more with regards to the ethics of architects, but how about the ethics of developers? Do you think, <laughs> I, I, it's not a disrespectful uh, question. Well, I, I mean, David, but you know, Again, it's really down to the uh, core values of the public enterprises. Uh, we talk about uh, corporate citizenship as important. And I think most actually businessmen is aware that you know, they cannot actually just take. They need to give back. If you look at a lot of the big enterprises, I mean, they have given back to the society in their own way. Um, you know, if you just look at the chairman of this uh, society, right? I mean, it doesn't mean that I'm a developer, therefore, you know, I cannot contribute back to the society. Well, don't know. Uh, I won't argue on that one, uh, whether there are conflict or not. But having sat on the town planning board for eight years, uh, uh, there are numerous examples. I, I, I won't, won't talk about giveaway. <laughs> privileged information, but basically we saw uh, the building of uh, inflated mm. fat. Uh, can you comment on that, whether that, that uh, is the issue? Uh, that uh, again, I think it's not inflated fat. Uh, the uh, buildable area uh, is uh, under the regulation is allowed. Um, the government approved the built area. Obviously, we need to educate the public and the buyer as what constitutes a good value. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it is a 300 square foot fat or 350 square foot fat. If in the largest fat you have a core that you cannot be used, then actually it's worse off. Um, so it's not just you know, an efficiency saying 85% net usable area. What happens if there is a bad layout and you cannot use the space, right? So you need to educate the public as to what constitutes uh, value for money, what is good architecture. Okay, uh, I'll let you off the hook <laughs> on that one. Uh, uh, let, let, let's move to my favorite subject. Uh, in, in one of your slides, you mentioned about building our community. Mm. Um, uh, can you elaborate on whether you are building community with the hardware only, or what about the software? Well, I think both is important. Um, you know, it's just like body and soul. I mean, you cannot have just one, right? You need to have both. And obviously, having a good hardware, good building environment will contribute, you know, to the activities being, uh, you know, um, activated within that building. So, you know, I am, you know, an architect developer who believes in the totality of the building and architecture. I mean, you cannot just say, you know, this is, you know, the hardware and, you know, you cannot really contribute to the software inside. 
I mean, architecture mm. does influence uh, people' behavior. So maybe all solid needs to melt into air. Thank you very much, yep. Michael, and um, uh, our ethical developer. Please friend, stay uh, behind. <laughs> <laughs> and Shade, can you come join us? Welcome, Shade. Um, Shade has practiced in uh, Stockholm as well as London. Now she's practicing in Hong Kong. And you know, we really welcome, I mean, you choose Hong Kong as a home for your practice. Thank you very much. Uh, a bit chilly here, no? <laughs> that one. Um, I'm going to um, talk a little bit more in a sort of historical perspective about the topics that uh, uh, Marissa and sorry, is, is it? Um, you can point anywhere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. Um, so, Should I, can you go oh, recording? Yes. Yep. Okay. So the first thing that comes to my mind um, when I uh, hear the words ethics and architecture is uh, Adolf Loos and uh, his essay uh, that's uh, Ornament and Crime, which he wrote in 1908. In his essay, he explored the idea that um, progress of culture um, is um, associated with the deletion of um, ornament from everyday objects. So therefore, it's a crime. Um, to force craftsmen and uh, builders to uh, waste their time on ornamentations. Um, he wrote um, like this, uh, those who have been tattooed and are not in custody are latent criminals or degenerate aristocrats. Uh, <laughs> with his position, um, he not only found a uh, sympathetic compatriot in the philosopher uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, but also his thoughts and architecture influenced the entire modernist uh, movement um, and had the final flourish in the brutalist movement of 1950s uh, up to mid-1970s, um, where one could say that ethics was everything and um, beauty was the uh, function of the ethics, um, a view that seldom was shared by the general public, however. The first large-scale materialization of the modernist view of architecture, uh, which at its root had um, its belief, um, which actually architecture could change the society, it could improve uh, the living conditions, and it could uh, help bridge the um, gap between rich and poor, uh, is perhaps the uh, Weisenhof estate uh, in Stuttgart, which um, was um, basically a housing uh, estate um, built for the International um, Exhibition of 1927. This project was led by Miss van der Rohe, and uh, there were buildings, um, among others, by um, like uh, Le Corbusier, um, Walter Gropius, uh, Bruno Taut, and um, um, Sharon, Hans Sharoon. Maybe this was a way forward, um, or perhaps there were other uh, powers in play. Um, one can see the development of modernism in architecture. It's, it's striving to, uh, um, to be a universal tool for betterment of society and, in a sense, beauty as a uh, function of ethics coming to some sort of grind um, or collapse, rather, um, with projects like these. Um, true, they do provide housing for um, less privileged, and um, but at, at the same time, they're actually creating, they're, they've become monsters and also create um, a lot of social uh, exclusions. So, um, I was just wondering, are they the materialization of what Jean-François uh, Lyotard called the end of Le Grand Récit, uh, or the big stories, or of Antonio Negri and uh, Michael Art's empire, where there's no aspect in society which can be transcended? 
uh, where everything is a function of uh, an all-encompassing economic power, um, to admittedly simplify a bit, but um, where, where have all the ethics gone? Um, not to mention, uh, where the, where's the beauty gone? But perhaps there's still um, a space for a role for architecture involving both um, ethics and beauty. Um, but we don't talk about utopia anymore, um, but rather about nowtopia, um, dodging the dystopia of empire. Um, no ambitions to save the world, uh, but small actions reacting to a situation um, using your own compass, still claiming some sort of um, a free space in society. It's been claimed that after the Japan's uh, tsunami, uh, architects have gained, ventured into, again ventured into a new old mode uh, where they are shouldering their social responsibilities. I think the answer is yes and no. Um, not in the way early modernists um, claimed, but rather in a nautopian way. Um, small actions fit for a specific situation, um, not necessarily suited for everybody or everyone uh, or everywhere. Um, I'm thinking sort of Shigeru Ban's temporary structures um, as well as um, Toyo Ito's small community houses. wrap up. Okay. <laughs> it's a, just a quick wrap up. Um, where, so where do I stand uh, in this, in this uh, question? Um, well, I can't claim to be an architect, um, architecture activist, and uh, I, I do not run a huge office, and I don't work with huge uh, scale. Actually, I work with mostly, but not only, uh, existing um, structures. But um, just a quick sort of example, perhaps just to do um, a very careful, respectful renovation of an old mountain resort in, in, in a remote area of Sweden or creating a nice um, energetic, um, warm environment for students and, and uh, professors in a, in a university town of Umeå. I mean, it could be a humble route from, from, for me. Um, I would like to just kind of wrap up quickly with to say that I do think there's some echo of, of out of laws in my work even though I believe that Spartan um, and the ethical uh, not, are not necessarily synonymous. Um, and I do believe in some idea of beauty. Um, it, if it means it's an environment for, um, you know, where everyone feels it's for them and it's not, uh, um, you know, um, for subjects um, in a social engineering experiment. So thank you, thank very, you very much. much. Donald. Yeah. Well, you are a relatively newcomer to our city. Yeah. And, you know, again, uh, for us that has been in the city for so long, we probably do not have a fresh eye to look at our city. I mean, what do you see in Hong Kong and what is the disciple building type for high density, high density city like Hong Kong? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, uh, it really depends on... Um, you know, first of all, you need to look at um, the land and, and mm. how, how this sort of typography of, of I mean, how this sort of, sh um, what, what it allows you to do. And um, I don't necessarily think that high rises and dense concrete blocks are actually the answer. Um, I, it's, it's very attractive that, that uh, many percentage of, of Hong Kong land is actually mm. a country park. That, that's, a, that's a unique situation that we have, which, uh, of course, is very attractive. Mm. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think it would be uh, better for, for people mm. to uh, have a, a more generous area of living and, and uh, in mm. order to sort of be able to breathe more and not to be sort of stuck up on, on each other. Um, to be, actually, to, I can't really give you an answer no. in such a short time. It depends no. where it is and what situation yeah. so, so it when is. So when you talk about, you know, a more spacious, you know, living yeah. Yeah. Area. Yeah. I mean, there is a different thought in our society that we should build to the minimum standard so that more people can be provided with the accommodation. Um, you see, I think, yeah, exactly. Maybe in one area of that thinking, there is a, some, there's some positive thing about it. But at the same time, I think if you look as a whole and, and, and certain consequences, I think that kind of very um, mm. rational thinking can be quite damaging to, um, 
as you know, in the long term. Mm. Um, in my short period of time in Hong Kong, actually, I've experienced. I mean, I I, I keep seeing that that a lot of um, planning are incredibly based on rational thinking, mm. and they actually decide to just almost get a tunnel vision when they go for mm. something, and they actually a lot of time have a positive. Um, view of something and, and aim at, at mm. something very positive, but at the end of the day, when they have you know executed mm. that in such a, you know strong way, they they, they exclude so mm. many other qualities, and then they end up with something really nasty mm. and really sort of without any spirit. I was just one of very sort of <laughs> example is that it's a positive idea to have common um, you know public space for for everyone. And, and the government provides this sort of uh, like a fixed seating, like mm. metal fixed seating and tables that, that sort of marks mm. that here is a public space. Everyone yeah. can, can use it. And so it's, it's kind of a positive act mm. from the government. But what is the result? I mean, how does these, these furniture look like? I mean, they're absolutely hideous. And <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's like... Um, such a such a mistake, mm. and to completely destroy the, the sort of spatial quality and, and sort of fix people into only one way of, of, of mm. interacting. I think they need to sort of relax so, and so, so, yeah, yeah, I think they need diversity, to really yeah. open up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and just you know, a question on building. I mean, do you think that different culture is different idea about building, and how would that you know from your experience because you have worked in many regions. Uh, you know, so the beauty in Europe or beauty in uh, Middle East, are they different from the beauty in Hong Kong? Um, perhaps uh, from the height aspect, mm. I would say, um, yeah, because, you, you know, the, the, in terms of how you use the space is different. Mm. Um, um, I, I think it's actually you, you, sp you use more space mm. to build sort of when you, when you did dedicate a certain area of, of, of a city, you have more sort of like horizontal space to expand mm. and to plan um, mm. for various uh, complex. Um, I, I find Hong Kong, you know, as we talked about before, is extremely, uh, this, the land mm. seems to be extremely limited and because it's really tried mm. to kind of keep it tight. Um, and that, that shapes the building, of course, because you have very little footprint. And mm. then, of course, if you can't go this way, you have to go that way. Um, and that's, that's why you get the repeat of high-rises ri high everywhere, and you mm. have such a dense mm. um, uh, sort of shape uh, of situation. So it, it, it gives them a choice. I mean, would you build high, or you want to spread out into the country park? I would spread out more. <laughs> you would spread out more. Yeah, absolutely. We, it carefully. Not too and, rationally. And you think that is still an ethical uh, practice, right? I mean, you're kind of taking part of the natural environment into, you know, making it uh, uh, urban. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Douglas, you had something you wanted to add quickly? You want me to say something? Oh. I, I think, actually, you, you showed a lot of public housing projects, uh, which is very interesting, because I think that's when architecture is... I mean, architecture... Architects as artists is in danger of sort of over-expressing themselves. Because after, at the end of the day, you're, you're suppressing a lot of people, millions of people in the case of Hong Kong, to your artwork. And maybe at the end of the day, uh, you know, public housing and proper architecture, such as this building or the LegCo or a museum building, is, is, is different. So I was just thinking, you know, is your particular interest in public housing or in people's in home environments or in... Uh, uh Absolutely, there's no limit in terms of, I mean, we, as architects, we always um, have a very um, sort of strong aim to improve things, to, uh, um, you know, challenge the conventions, uh, I mean, as sensitively as we can. So regardless of what type of project, if it's public housing, if it's a public building, or if it, whatever it is, I think this is a view that I, I, I'm sure I share with all of my architects' colleagues. Um, so it's basically, at the same time, I have to say, we're not standing alone in, in this position. Uh, we are absolutely hand in hand with developers and, and along with the, everyone else, you know, that, that uh, project is, is, is dependent on. So, you know, they, their priorities also will play a role. And uh, 
that's, that's something we need, really need to put into to, uh, the account of, of the result of what we are creating. So I, I really don't think architects alone can, can contribute. Thank to you, Shade. Thank you, Donald. <laughs> and Eric, do you want to join us? There's your, hus there's your husband. Cliff and Ken, this is very tricky. Yeah. But <laughs> so... Okay, I would like to introduce Eric Schuldenfrei, who is an uh, assistant uh, professor um, of uh, Hong Kong University, and also you are um, a partner of uh, the, the studio uh, SQ, um, working on um, other projects alongside of your academical practice. So. Thank you, Shade. It's, it's great to be here. Um, the question I really want to ask today is where can architecture intercept with larger goals of society? Where does architecture fit in? And I think really to begin with the education of an architect and the problems that architects ask themselves and how a problem, a design problem is understood within a social, political, or economic uh, situation. This is a thesis student of mine at Hong Kong U where he was really questioning and asking um, addressing issues of water and also other types of uh, resource shortages in northern China. But what was important about the project was that throughout the semester he was asking more questions than providing answers. And so I guess he's working as an artist, uh, according to Rocco. And I, th I think it was a really important part of the process. Um, another important part of the process is really um, how one intercepts uh, and works with society in terms of the public venue. This was a 2009 Viennale where we facilitated the building of a Shigeru Bomb pavilion uh, here in Hong Kong. 90% of our time was really spent with government officials uh, in order to, for, to, to, in, to build this, uh, in order to see it through in Shigeru Bond's vision as well. We really hope to spend 90% of our time with the artists and architects uh, instead of the government, but we realized that we actually had to join forces and work closely with the government in order to build something that at the time was impossible to build in Hong Kong, a building out of paper. And so really we had to push the bounds and work very closely and take a genuine commitment in order to foresee how architecture can collide with society uh, in a good way. Uh, one of the other artists and uh, architects actually for the Biennale, uh, this was again for the 2009 Biennale, where as curators we selected this work because it was a projecting window. It's the windows that we see across the city. And for us, this, que this question was really uh, posed by the architects of the criteria that the government had written um, in, in the law to give developers a G free GFA, basically, if they pr provide architecture of this sort. Um, but here we really ask, is beauty something that the government should be writing? Should they be scripting that? Is it ethical for the government to be scripting down to the millimeter what these dimensions really are? And so it really takes a, another route um, as soon as the government starts to do such a thing. And one of the ways out that we potentially see is how a competition can really intersect with society. Um, this was a competition that we uh, won an award for here in Hong Kong, and it's providing habitats for birds for a noise barrier. Usually the birds crash into the, the perspex glass of the noise barrier and die. And so we thought we'd provide a, a habitat for them instead of killing them. Um, <laughs> the only disadvantage of competitions that we've seen in Hong Kong so far is that often the competition winner, although they win the competition, it's built by someone else or it's controlled by someone else. And so the issue at stake here is that often for economic or political reasons, the person who's building it the is, is shipped to another designer. And we see that as almost like a politician winning an election only to hand off that vision to another politician to execute it. And there's something ethically wrong with this, I'd say. And there's some sort of moral mishap when you take away the winning architect and hand that to another person in order to enact that vision. And I'd like to conclude here with another Biennale project that we had. The Biennale was a good time to question things, actually. And this is by artist Zhu Bing. And what he's doing here is educating school kids to draw pictures of trees. The school kids then sell these trees for a profit. That profit goes to plant actual trees in Kenya. And so it's really not only teaching art, not only teaching beauty, not only teaching the kids how to draw, but it's also teaching at the very same time this very ethical and moral ground. It's also teaching them how their work relates in Hong Kong, 
back into the world around them as well. So that's where I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Um, so we have heard a lot about um, how government is um, dealing with various um, issues involving architects um, attempting to sort of work ethically and, and sort of improve things. Um, how do you think architects uh, in Hong Kong can actually have an impact uh, on how the government actually is, is running their office and, and how they actually sort of deal with all these strict regulations? Absolutely. I, I believe it's events like this, actually, that make an, us all more aware. It allows us to raise questions. It allows us to ask questions um, to each other. It also allows us to provide a more public forum for such a debate. So I really thank, actually, the, the, even the inception of this as an idea in a way to communicate to a larger public. But I also think as architects, things like biennales uh, are very important. It allows for this opportunity to question as an ar architect and as a designer, not only how we build a building, but actually how we communicate what we do and what we think back out to society. And I think it's very important that we ask more architects to join us when we do biennales, to join us when we do design competitions, and allow a lot more open interface, especially in the terms of a design competition, back to society. Because that's also where you can ask questions without um, always thinking about every detail of the development at stake, where you don't have to question every window mullion at that point in the, the development, and that allows questions of a larger society. I'd say. And also, I wanted to, can you elaborate a little bit more on the competition um, sort of um, problem that, that you mentioned that architects actually do win, but then at the, same, at the same time, government decides to just go for something um, more adaptable, or uh, I, I don't know how they sort of even allow themselves to do that. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that problem? The, um, it seems to be a very unique Hong Kong issue. Okay. I, it's something I haven't seen outside of Hong Kong. I, I might be wrong, and I'm sure Rocco I'm coming is, from America. Rocco is laughing. <laughs> He's really <laughs> laughing over there. So. But, but it wasn't Rocco's um, design competition that he won. That was actually the, the one that stood in my mind. The one that stood in my mind was for the, 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 um, the expo. And that was one by very young architects, uh, but who were experienced. They had built buildings before working for the government, actually. And then the architecture service department took it on. And they took it on as a project, and the government architecture service department built the building for them. I find that problematic because the architects, I don't even know if they're invited to the opening, but the first time that they saw the building was when they went there, more or less. And I find there's a real disconnect because it doesn't allow the architect to A, learn the mistakes, perhaps, of building the building if it's a young architect. It doesn't allow a larger interface with the government. Um, and so I think that that's a system that we really should question. Um, even in the West Kowloon, it's written into the, to the even the public um, idea of the uh, West Kowloon papers that it's a design consultant, I believe, um, is the word that they use. Mm -hmm. It's that they're hiring a design consultant. They're not hiring a master planner. And it's a very clear division. And so there can be, at almost any point, a split between the conceptual consultant and the actual master planner. That's also, I would find, can be unusual. Um, it could also be a matter for the lawyers. I mean, maybe there is room for paperwork like that. <laughs> Actually, I think in Hong Kong, it's fashionable. it's fashionable to blame developers for ugly buildings, but we often forget that the government's actually one of the largest patrons. You know, they build museums, even small bus shelters or garbage disposal units and whatnot, street furniture, for instance. They are potentially big clients for, for young architects and designers. I mean, what, what is your view of government patronage? Do you think the system should be improved? Or? No, I, there's many, many huge benefits. I mean, they're also the benefactor for the Biennales as well. They're a benefactor for a lot of these initiatives that we're very much engaged with. And so I think it's, it's also how we engage the government. And actually, hopefully, there's more forums that allow for us to engage more closely with the government as well. And I think also, I have to say, that the, the, through the Biennale experience, the Hong Kong government is also very proactive. Um, it reminds, or I keep reminding people during the Biennale, which we, we put together in five months on a site of land um, that the government also gave us. Uh, and they didn't know, but we asked for the site of land next door to it. And we were able to get that as well, almost immediately. And I kept reminding everyone on the team that it took Christo 20 years 
to build the gates in New York City. That's 20 years worth of bureaucracy that he had to go through. And so if we were able to get a spot of land that we desired within an, a few weeks, that's a very proactive government that we're dealing with in Hong Kong. I mean, speaking with a lot of young architects, I get the impression that actually there aren't enough projects for them, for, for a young architect to establish themselves. For young firms, it's actually very difficult because most of the projects go to either the government department or to large existing, I mean, established architects. Don't you think that there should be more opportunities for you know, smaller projects to go to younger, budding, potential talents? This agree. is actually, agree. I'll, I'll answer, I, okay. yeah, I, okay, I agree. This is actually, I think, room for the next debate because I think this is actually one of the most pressing issues within Hong Kong, but across society, across uh, the world, actually, is that how you can give more opportunity to younger architects. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, Shade. And and Ju Rung. So joining me on stage is uh, G.R. Kim, or J.R. Kim, and she is the director of J.R.K. Associates in Seoul, Korea. Hi, um, actually, um, I found a couple of interesting images with words in, the face, in my Facebook, so I put them together. Um, I'd like to read the, the first statement first. In the midst, midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. Um, I'd like to talk about um, the acquisition culture. Uh, in architectural profession in general. Um, after the, and you, actually, you know, when we talk about the business modality of architects, uh, it's really a, a business of consultancy. And um, after the economic collapse, um, there are many young architects' offices, but also, also mid-sized offices, which suffers uh, from you know, actually almost to a, uh, going into the bankruptcy. Um, so one, like when I moved, moved, moved back to uh, Seoul after uh, living in States and London, um, the architectural culture is actually very different from that of what I've been trained and educated uh, in um, in Western uh, pedagogy. So. Um, in order to survive as a small practitioner uh, in Korea, um, I had to think about, re I had to rethink about the notion of architectural uh, food chain, let's say. What is the notion of patron and artisan, commissioner and commissioned, and the developer versus architects? And the culture of uh, client, uh, the relational behavior between the architects and the client is very different for, from that of what I've experienced in Europe, in particular in London. Um, the, depending on the, like for example in states in Europe, the maturity of the, the economic status uh, is, um, is very mature, unlike Asia or any emerging markets like India, Dubai, Middle East, or in Southeast Asia nowadays. Um, so um, I've moved on from uh, architects. I set up my own office 2003 in Seoul, right after I moved back to Korea. And then I uh, worked as a struggled architect to survive. And then I changed my profession as a developer uh, in year 2007, uh, mainly working for international developers who are operating in Korea or elsewhere, uh, actually international developers. Uh, and then afterwards, I moved on to uh, corporate branding, uh, like not just the, the, the local co corporates, but the global corporate brandings. And now I'm doing, um, uh, I moved on to um, actually um, 
a different type of uh, manufacturing and soil distribution from different uh, continents. Um, so you can see that actually um, I've started as an, as an architect, but then uh, my career or my profession as an architect has moved on uh, and evolved into a series of different areas. Um, I like to use an example of uh, um, Monsieur Bernard Arnold, uh, the chairman of LVMH. Uh, he was actually a failed developer, uh, but uh, that's why he started to buy all these different brands and did all these vertical manufacturing processes and M&A. And also nowadays they do uh, uh, buy out all the companies of the raw materials uh, and goes back to the, the high-end real estate developments. Uh, so, but actually the way that uh, I think that the essence of... Um, architectural profession uh, is not bounded by architects, per se, but uh, I think anyone who does architectural thinking uh, is what profession defines. So the new notion of um, architectural profession, um, I found it as a uh, Mm, it's almost like a, you become an uh, architectural prosumer. Nowadays, not, you know, actually it was interesting that David showed that only 8% of uh, developments uh, or buildings were designed by architects. There are many people now with a new, newly developed technology, they can even build, design, and construct. Uh, within this changed environment, how can you redefine the role of traditional role of architects? Also, how can you do, rather than this didactic notion of international style versus vernacular style, now in a global setting, how can you make an inclusive cultural branding uh, in architecture, uh, architectural discipline? Um, also, lastly, um, how can you be your own client uh, rather than, you know, having this uh, discourse between who's the client and who's the architect. Thank you, Jurong. Eric. Thank you. Uh, the word prosumer is actually very interesting to me because it's a portmanteau. It's the producer and the consumer. And that was a word that Alvin Toffler came up with in the 1970s. Uh, the context he was thinking about was very different to the word, way the word is defined now. But I think as an artist and a, like an architect, it's a very interesting word because it assumes that the consumer is not just a consumer, that they're actually involved with the entire creative process, that they're producing the work that we see in front of us as well, that they're involved with the creative process um, and the, the cultural process. And as a branding expert and in, in looking towards corporate branding, is this idea of including the public back into the process an important ethical question? Is the reason why? Or is it something that it has another way of looking? Uh, including the public as a process of... Uh, I'm just looking uh, at the, the inclusive cultural branding. What, what do you mean by the word inclusive? I mean, for me, actually, uh, the beauty of... Uh, architectural thinking is when one becomes a visionary and when one can suggest a three-dimensional way of perceiving uh, our environments, our problems. And maybe uh, the problem of ethics, maybe it's not a problem actually, in my mind, the, the ethics is when one balances out different interests of uh, uh, involved interest, involved parties, for example, like the users, the develop, the clients, um, uh, architects. Many, many people are involved in a process of making an architecture. 
And when there is a fine balance of, you know, that everybody have a win-win situation, I think that's, to me, is an ethical, uh, rather than whether, you know, it's an unbalanced situation. And can, I mean, looking back towards also uh, Shade's presentation too, where the public housing um, came into play, and public housing had the most ethical goal in mind as well, to house such a large swath of our population. Um, but there's also almost lack of individuality. Do you feel like the, having this idea of individuality is also important as an architect, as a visionary? Yes, of course, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> JR, can I just ask, where did you get these images from? They're absolutely beautiful. <laughs> the ones on the left, the, the truisms, maybe you called them. Where did you, did you create them? I found it in the Facebook. <laughs> I shop images in my Facebook every day. <laughs> I love them, wonderful. So Facebook is a perfect, uh, perfect venue for the prosumer culture. The idea that you also, not only are you absorbing information from Facebook, but you're actually contributing information to Facebook as well. And so uh, it's, it's also the perfect inclusive culture where everyone can actually share ideas as well. Um, was there a specific reason why you went to Facebook? Was it only because it was easy and quick, or is there actually other components of Facebook that you find that you can include? Um, actually, uh, Facebook, um, I, I go in there like every day, it's like uh, my, uh, you know, when I wake up, it's <laughs> one of the first things that I do. But then uh, it's interesting, like, like you're saying, one, one person puts up an image on a post and some people share it, but depending on who shares it, the image can be interpreted totally different ways. You know, it can have totally different meanings. And how you present it, also, it can be a totally different thing. The same image can be many things. Do you have a good example of that? Is there some, is it, was there an image or a campaign? <laughs> so so the, the person who put this up had one idea and interpretation, but you're... I'm sure, a totally different idea, but I put it in an architectural context, which to me, um, it was exactly the right context to put it, yeah. I have one question. What kind of buildings are you developing now? Um, <laughs> I did, um, my smallest work was a Manolo Blanding shop, very small in a retail <laughs> store. The biggest work was um, uh, about $4 billion work, the development work, uh, mixed use development uh, in Korea, in Busan. The latest work was the, 128-story tower development mixed use in Busan. Yeah. So the scale varies, depends. Okay, thank you for sharing your projects with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. And Jiron, please stay behind. Our final speaker, Abe Sang. Lastly, but not least, <laughs> Hitoshi um, Abe, he's the chairperson of uh, architecture and urban planning in UCLA. Hi. Um, okay. Actually, I have a problem to deal with the uh, beauty and ethics as uh, some kind of contracti contracti contradicting notion. And uh, to me, I think those are that notion exists in a totally different dimension. And, uh, you know, like, you know, beautiful lady sometimes can be very smart and uh, also, you know, effective in the work. And then you, you don't really see that, you know, that the ugly person can be smart. You know, it's like that. So I really uh, think that, uh, <laughs> um, I think more the problem happens when somebody tried to use ethics to influence on the aesthetic, to take that as a strategy to make a statement and to influence something. I see that it's rather uh, very dangerous. And uh, 
you know, the, you, we see many of those throughout the histories, and usually it ends really, uh, you know, disaster. And that made, actually, this incident took place in Japan made me think about this a lot. And as you can see, it was horrible things, and uh, uh, this is a photograph of the area I grew up. And uh, um, naturally, as an architect, you start to think what you can do. And also, I learned that there's nothing I could do to prevent this as an architect. And uh, um, many architects, I think, in Japan felt the same way. But uh, this area, actually, is really different from like a place like a Kobe uh, suffered uh, by the earthquake um, 12 years ago. Uh, because the area destroyed in this earthquake is a very rural and uh, community which was already losing population, very weak industry, and also uh, it was just shrinking before even the earthquake. Now, um, after the earthquake, they are losing more populations, and it's not enough to bring the situation back where it was what's needed is a kind of a new vision to give more opportunity to this area, which is very difficult at the current situation because the way the government works is basically segmenting the each community and encourage them to compete against each other rather than collaboration. But in order to create a larger vision, actually, and also to enhance uh, the vitality of the area, you have to have actually the more shared vision. And, uh, um, but also, I thought this kind of a, a sort of a, a job, creating shared vision by connecting different phenomena, by connecting different conditions, is something we can really, we means architect can do really good. But unfortunately, architects, Japanese architects are not really involved in this process. Or almost they are giving up on it. And, uh, you know, if you look at the proposal by big architects, like really much senior people, they are proposing temporary housing, so the little meeting rooms for the temporary housing, rather small project, which was presented by actually you. And it looks kind of interesting, but the problem is that the work should be done by people like me or much younger people. That was all they could do. That makes me really disappointed and hungry. And also, the funny thing is there's a switch from like ethics turning into aesthetic, and then somehow the architect tend to talk about this issue as if there's an issue of ethics, no, aesthetics. And then sort of use that ex as an excuse not to be part of this much larger uh, political uh, sort of uh, activity. I think. I believe, actually, architect has more to do, and architect has to really uh, try, at least, uh, to influence a much larger mechanism to really be part of producing this much larger vision. So uh, many architects in Japan, maybe 300 architects got together to start this um, relief and recovery network by architects. Uh, called the arcade. And we have these three visions, but mostly what we do is we go out to the field and work with a local community and uh, uh, help them to produce the vision uh, together. And uh, uh, we are trying to s sort of push those strategy to the central government and uh, hopefully that we can help to create this larger vision. And I think we shouldn't really mix the aesthetics with the ethics. And I think it's very important that we really trust that the architect can do much better than these kind of stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you? This, I'm just curious, can you describe more of this, uh, your activities of um, Arch yeah. Archie 8? Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, 
together with, I, I guess that it's a loose network of architects. And uh, many architects who is part of this teaches at the university. So what we do is because local small government doesn't have a manpower or resources to come up with their own future vision, and they're rushed. So we send these architects and students to work with the local government to produce their master vision. And then that could be also connected to the other sort of a, a, a local government through our platform so that hopefully we can really offer much larger vision toward the future. And uh, uh, we are trying to push it to influence the much larger plans proposed by the central government. So that's what we do. Can you give uh, one example, for example? Uh, for instance, um, Oshika Peninsula was heavily uh, uh, destroyed by the earthquake. And, uh, oops, it's gone. And we sent 15 architects and 15 universities to each villages. And then, then uh, they worked with a local community and then came up with a plan. So there's like a probably over 20 something plan produced within a matter of two weeks. And then it was submitted to the uh, city who oversees this entire villages and area and integrated into their master plan. And uh, still there's a struggle, but uh, we are trying to really fight to change the situation. So there's a website, so please check arcade.com. And then it's only in Japanese, and there's a few English, but uh, many support is needed. I'm just curious about, for example, people who are the victims of earthquake. Um, psychologically, um, are they like, what are the, the things that this archi aid can create to reconstruct, in right. a way, their hope or their psychological damage? The, you know, there are many small projects done uh, by the uh, in, in architects in the initial phase like making little committees, you know, meeting rooms and putting some flower. And those all helps uh, to make people feel good temporarily. But the problem of these people is they cannot really think about the future. They are in a temporary housing and then they don't know how, if the committee will be, uh, become totally different or will become, you know, like old time. So uh, they are really, what they need to go step forward is the some sort of a vision that they can trust. So that's where we are trying to help. No, that's, that's great. Actually, um, I don't know. No. <laughs> uh, sorry, may I ask a question? I was wondering, under such desperate situations, does the architect's training or your or the, the the quality standard would you ha would you have to compromise yourself in order to to meet this urgent need for build for quick building would you have to compromise quality or is it i mean is it necessary compromise to quality i mean the the traditional you know um we we were we were brought up to produce great buildings and you know things that last and and but to but me we, we, circumstances? we work uh, based on a condition, right? So the great building doesn't really mean that you have to have everything. Even in a very poor situation, in the most severe case, maybe that's opportunity to make something really great. That's why the ethics and the aesthetics doesn't really uh, live in the uh, same dimension. Bad building is a bad building, and then the good building is usually beautiful and functional. And uh, uh, you know that's what it is. Yeah, but under such a situation where you know you are in urgent need to build buildings, you may have to make certain compromises. And would these compromises be justifiable, uh, or would these buildings be expected Compromise to be? Compromise meaning. Meaning, say, because you you need to house the people within a very short time, so you may have to make do with poor quality material that's just readily available. Um, 
Are you I, expected that these buildings are just stopgap measures, or are they supposed to be built? You're talking to last? about temporary shelters, or temporary shelters, or even the buildings that will be built. No, the building has to be in a good, good quality. I mean, it's it's a house for somebody, and then somebody who has to move out from maybe the existing community and live there as a new home, and that has to be good quality, and there should be no compromise. And uh, uh, you know, again, uh, this issue of making good building is. Uh, that's something that uh, we, as an architect, has to try every time, no matter the, what the condition is, and there's no excuse to that. And sometimes the problem rises because some people try to somehow use this ethics to talk about aesthetics and, or use it as an excuse of not accomplishing something. But you just fail, actually. And, uh, uh, you know, was that? As an architect, we have to be able to build a good building even we have a piece of paper, right? So that's kind of where I stand. And uh, for a disaster situation, right, that's where actually the good building is needed, especially right now. And I learned that the architect, as an architect, we cannot prevent the disaster, but uh, we can create the hope because ultimately the design is a very positive action. And uh, that's why we are here, right, to make hope. Thank you very much, Avisang, for sharing your hope with us. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Jurong, for interviewing. Please take your seats. And um, we're gonna actually going to invite Cliff on stage. And um, our respondents is Lawrence here. And um, Jimmy. Thank you, everyone, for staying. It's actually, I think, a little bit over time, but I do want to ask um, uh, Cliff to end and help us with the closing with comments. Um, and if there's a chance, maybe we have one or two questions from the floor as there's time. It's been a very exciting discussion, and um, maybe Douglas also, if you have a few comments. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was really interesting. First of all, I want to thank everyone for contributing. What, some of the issues that I saw that were raised by a lot of the different speakers, one was the issue of scale. Um, on one level, because problems, some of the problems are so big, it prevents architects or people in general from seeing a way to solve them. When you look at you know, the issue of poverty, how do you deal with such a giant issue? If all, you know, you're just an architect, um, in the face of a tsunami, a, uh, an earthquake, um, again, the problem is so big, um, the question is, how do architects find a way to sort of edge their way in? And um, it was interesting to see there are different strategies. Sometimes you edge your way in just by getting your foot in the door a little bit. and. Uh, Sometimes it can be by infecting other people, by educating other people. Um, it then is something that is passed on. Um, the individual doesn't have to solve the whole problem. Sometimes just raising the issue or just providing a small solution that then can be built on by other people. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely an issue that um, uh, scale can be difficult whether it's really big or even when it's really small, um, how do you create you know, a little temporary um, uh, house for someone, even though you know it's gonna disappear in eight months or whatever? Um, so even when the issue is smallness or small in terms of its, um, the time frame, um, it can also be difficult, but at the same time, that creates the challenge for the architect. Um, and architecture is always about making compromises. The question is, which are the compromises that you make that you're willing to live with? Maybe you make it out of a cheaper material, but you use more creativity. Um, anyway, I think it'd be great if we opened it up to some questions from the audience. So I invite people 
If you have a particular question for a particular speaker, that's great. If you have a question for the panel in general, we can also accommodate that. Hi, um, I have a question directed to uh, Mr. Michael Lai, please. Um, in the context of today's forum, which is uh, the dualism and relationship between ethics and beauty and architecture, um, I myself am inclined towards Abizan's um, theory that uh, perhaps this is an illusion, the contradiction between beauty and ethics in urban planning and architecture. But to play the devil's advocate a little bit, um, I think if there is such a discourse and there's such a contradiction between beauty and so-called aesthetics and um, ethics in architecture, perhaps one of the most interesting cases being discussed today is the Blue House which is a historically graded building in Hong Kong. It's also a building in the center of Hong Kong that houses lower income people, communities, so to speak, one of the last communities in the old historical Wan Chai. So uh, Mr. Lai earlier spoke quite a bit about community and the importance of community and how his group has been able to engage community in the development of Wan Chai, specifically through the charitable endeavors of St. James's group. But uh, the other side, talking about beauty, to take stretch of metaphor a little bit further, is heritage, which I haven't really heard um, Mr. Lai speak too much about. So, if you can, please elaborate about what you understand to be the heritage of Blue House, and um, how do you intend re to revitalize and conserve the heritage of Blue House cluster? Thank you. All right, thank you <coughs> for your question. Uh, given the five minutes duration, I couldn't expand on the software side. Uh, Basically, we want the Blue House is traditionally a uh, Chinese sort of Western style building, Tong Lao, in, in, in our Cantonese sense. That's why we are going to preserve not only the uh, hardware side of it, but the software side. The software being the culture, the people, the uh, heritage characteristic. Uh, of one Chai, how people live at the turn of the last century. And at the same time, we have put in a livelihood museum whereby uh, we put in uh, stuff which is of the uh, last uh, millennium, uh, and then we put in a lot of other stuff in the museum itself. And top of this, the very important thing is that uh, Sixty percent of the whole cluster will be open to the public. It's not only for the resident alone. There will be about twenty uh, residents living in the building, and they don't just live there. They have to commit themselves to be sort of culture tourist guide. They have to be um, people volunteering to help out with the building itself in leading culture group around Ran Chai. So basically, when we preserve the hardware, uh, it's not just like a tourist attraction, um, but it's for the people of Ran Chai, it's for the people of Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Do we have um, another question from the floor? William. Can I ask a question not for the panelists, but for Ms. Carrie Lam? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask, do you see Hong Kong as beautiful? Would you like to take that question or? Yeah. OK. I did not expect that I would be asked a question. Um, I think Hong Kong is a great city because for a place like us, which uh, we don't have any natural resources, we could become 
Hong Kong today, which is Asia's world city. And this is only made possible by the people here. So um, I came here because I was, uh, I find this topic fascinating, the architecture between beauty and ethics. And also I find um, a very relevant theme of how we could use architecture to bridge the current disparity between the rich and the poor. I personally, I don't believe architecture can have that role. <laughs> That's why I come to learn. Uh, but I have to say that I, I have not been given the answer yet, maybe <laughs> another time. <laughs> but uh, coming back to this uh, very simple question of whether this place is beautiful, uh, I think it is. I think it is. Because uh, in such a small place, uh, you have a lot of things combining together. Okay? Uh, it is not easy to find a city that have so many things um, so close together. So I heard uh, Shida talking about our country parks. This is one of the, one of the most valuable assets of Hong Kong. The Victoria Harbour Front is another very valuable asset in Hong Kong. And somebody asked about heritage buildings. I think they are also very valuable assets of Hong Kong. Uh, it is up to us to really uh, to enhance the contribution to this beautiful city of Hong Kong. Um, and I personally have, um, have a lot of conviction uh, in what this, uh, be this beautiful city uh, could become in time to come. And I just take this opportunity to thank Rocco, because I can assure him that the Tema project is doing good, because I do feel good <laughs> having moved into uh, Tema for four or five months. Uh, but I did not realize that he has this he has this mission to accomplish in the Tamer project by putting three distinct institutions under one roof, the Legislative Council, the Executive Council, and the government. Uh, I now have a better understanding of why Tamer is designed in such a way that um, I find it very inhibited, inhibited to walk from my office to LegCo. <laughs> Now, I was really scratching my head because every time I walk to Lechko, I have to pass through this walkway, which, is, which has a little bit of cover, but it's always very windy, and if it is in heavy rain, we, we got wet. I just did not understand why Rocco Yim did not design a much more convenient and comfortable walkway. And now I understand because he feels that we, are, we do not want to be near Lechko, so we do not want to have a comfortable walkway. But I want to assure him and I assure all of you here that Hong Kong will not succeed if there isn't that sort of mutual trust and cooperation between the executive and the legislature. At the end of the day, we have, as a government, we have to be kept on our toes by a very vigilant um, and democratically elected legislature. That is the only way to ensure that uh, we will continue to be uh, the sort of uh, government that you people want to see. Thank you very much. Mrs. Carrie Lam, thank you for being our wild card roulette player. I really wish you had um, joined us earlier, but I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for coming. Wonderful audience, um, great supporters, wonderful speakers willing to come experiment with us this evening. And to all the sponsors and Asia Society, AIA Hong Kong, um, Lux Newhouse, Storm Brock, and typing carpets. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do this evening without your support. And thank you, my co-moderator, Douglas. And um, if I forget someone, I'll thank you wonderfully later. And have a wonderful evening. Thank you for coming today.